Firstly, during the first three centuries after Christ, the overwhelming political posture of Christianity was pacifism. We know that the Edict of Toler Toleration by Kaiser Galerius in 311 began the transformation of Christianity into a politically favoured religion. Three centuries later, Pope Gregory the Great is the ruler of Rome, and by 800 AD, we have the Holy Roman Empire with a Christian army. Does Christianity incurably morph into a political, that is, militant religion, if granted political favour over other religions? Interestingly, I think the, the, the really the key turning point in the transformation of Rome into Christendom took place under Justinian in 482 to 5. 65. Um, Justinian, a very, Justinian, a very strong Christian, um, regulated and formalized Roman law. And the so-called Justinian Code uh, is, in some respects, still the foundation of, of European law in a number of countries. And part of the code was that anyone who was not a Christian was a non-citizen of Rome. And uh, so that was a that was a huge step, basically, to say, if you weren't a Christian, you were a non-person. You were you were an alien to the to the Roman um, identity, uh, and in fact, the Justinian Code included discriminatory provisions for the abuse of Jews, which later Islam copied and used to suppress Christians and and Jews as well. Um, so the Justinian Code, which was the the triumph of Christianity in a political sense, um, also. Uh, established Christianity as the law of the land, and it ultimately led to um, profound abuses against Christians when when Islam learned lessons from it. Um, I don't think Christianity has to incurably morph into a political religion if granted political favor. To give you an example, the United States, uh, its foundations were very Christian. There were some amongst the founding fathers of the Constitution who were not such strong believers, but basically if the Christians had wanted to turn America into a religious state, they could have. They had the power to do that at the time, but they deliberately chose not to. They deliberately chose to establish a nation that was um, that was not the handmaiden of religion and was not an instrument of a particular religion. So that's, I think, an example that illustrates that Christianity doesn't have to become a, mili a, mi a militant religion if granted political favor it doesn't have to do that but it can and the idea of christendom obviously brought huge brought huge benefits for christianity but it also fundamentally i think corrupted it because it it merged politics and faith um in ways that reverberated through the following centuries i think the idea that military forces will use religion to justify the battles they fight that's always going to happen you know that's inevitable um when people are fighting for their survival or just fighting for other things like more land or control or, or pride they will call they'll, they'll exploit religion and they'll exploit all sorts of identities so christianity will always come under pressure to be used um, but it doesn't have to end up where it did uh with the with the roman empire with with justinian um, my second question is, the Sira confirms that before waging war against another nation, Muhammad would first send a letter demanding their surrender to Islam. Upon their rejection, he would attack, and sometimes without mercy. Did Hamas follow that protocol before October the 7th? Uh, no, they didn't. That protocol is <clears throat> for when Islam is, is going out against um, a nation that's not yet been conquered. It's, it's, it's the message you send to a nation that um, is not yet Islamic. Um, and Israel is not in that category. This is not an unconquered nation. It's a rebellious nation, if you like. It's a, it, the Jews have been conquered already. Uh, this is conquered land. It belongs to Islam. And, and the Jews are, of Israel are, from an Islamic point of view, are illegally occupying um, what is an Islamic inheritance. So this is not uh, attacking a new nation situation this is uh overthrowing a false power that shouldn't have been there in the first place so there's a there's a principle in islam that when uh, islamic territory is occupied uh the whole every muslim has a has an individual every muslim man has a responsibility to fight so it's a it's a trigger for 
for war uh, without these pre these kind of diplomatic preambles. But um, there have been cases where people have issued warnings like that in modern times. For example, in Indonesia, um, Australians were warned to convert or else <laughs> by an Indonesian cleric. Uh, this was part of the uh, the threat really to Australia. So you'll you'll see situations sometimes where that happens. Or, but but it's really this is that that protocol in the Syria is really for conquest of new nations that have not yet been part of Islam, not for dealing with rebellious situations within within the House of Islam. Question three, Islam is unapologetically a political monotheism in the full sense of the word. Is that why they perceive Christianity is also as a political faith? Do they see us through the frame of their own worldview? If yes, how do they respond to manifestations of Christian pacifism as promoted so strongly by Pope Francis? Well, yes, Islam does see Christianity as a political religion. Um, and uh, they will... Um, sorry, I'm just noting the timing. Um, they will uh, frame it in that way, but they see it as a kind of pathetic political religion. They see that Christians are pacifists. They they despise that. Um, so... Um, that that means that they they see it as a failed example of 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 Islam, if you like, a, a failed instance of what a religion should be. Even Khaldun, who was a um, a Muslim uh, intellectual and regarded as a forerunner of political science, he criticised the separation of religion and politics in Christianity, and said that in the Muslim community, holy war, that is jihad, is a religious duty because of the universalism of the Muslim mission and the obligation to convert everyone to Islam, either by persuasion or force. In contrast, the weakness of Christianity, he said, is that Christian rulers are not under obligation to gain power over other nations, as is in the case of Islam. So Muslims frame Christianity um, as, a, as, as being like, as it ought to be like Islam, because they see Christianity as originally having an Islamic characteristic, but basically as a failed example of what a religion should be. Number four, since we entered the global era after World War II, a well-circulated mantra is that all religions are prone to violence, especially monotheisms like Christianity, Islam. If a journalist should ask you if you can refute that, how would you reply? Well, one problem is postmodernism. That is the idea that you can that you can make any text whatever you want it to be, like that interpretation is in the is in the eyes of the reader. So some people will say, of course, you can you can justify anything from religious text, and and that means once they take that view, they they don't actually they're not bothered trying to actually work out what the religious text could be used to to support. Um, a simple answer you might give is. Um, if someone kills in the name of Allah, they're doing what Muhammad did. But if someone kills in the name of God, they're doing the opposite of what Jesus taught. Jesus is not the Joshua of the Old Testament. Um, another answer could be Islam almost always was spread by conquest, but Christianity has been mainly spread by peaceful proclamation. Even today, Islamic states own and spread Islam and they impose it by force, but Christian uh, states don't, and even the Christian colonial powers like Great Britain were often opposed to the work of missionaries, and the missionaries worked often independently of the state. Uh, question five, the only phrase that Hamas jihadis were shouting while killing the innocent Israelis on October the 7th was Allahu Akbar, which is a proclamation of divine victory. Um, this is shouted everywhere by pro-Palestinian supporters around the world in all the demonstrations. Now, this is the takbir, the proclamation of uh, Allah is greater. <laughs> um, it's the most repeated phrase on the planet, making Allah the most repeated name on earth for millions of mosques every day. What should Christians conclude about this phrase, which is both a war cry and a pious call to prayer? Well, for Christians, say, from the Middle East, um, Allah, oh Akbar, in a way, is designed to send shivers down your spine because it's a it's a declaration that Allah is greater. That means um, Islam should be superior over all religions. Surah 933 says, um, Allah has sent his messenger with the guidance and the religion of truth that he may cause it to triumph over all religion, however much the idolaters or the rejecters of Islam 
made is like this. So Islam teaches the supremacy of religions, and and so this cry is uh, is really a that it's a battle cry. It's a it's a victory cry. It's a it's always been found whenever people are being killed in jihad. It's always being uttered, or or other abuses are being committed as well. Why do professional journalists have such a poor grasp of explaining violence in any religion, and in particular in Islam? Well, um, it's partly the problem of religious illiteracy in our culture. Um, there's a view that's deep in secular culture that religion's irrelevant. Nothing is caused by religion. Religion is a, Marx said it was the opiate of the masses, which means it's the drug. It's not the driver. It's something, it's a technique, a, a tactic to dull people's senses, but it's not actually cause of anything. So many Western intellectuals think that religion is not a fundamental explanation of anything. It's just um, a fairy tale distraction from the realities of life. There's also a poor understanding amongst journalists of how faith forms culture. Many secular intellectuals have long, long assumed that religions are just disappearing. Um, I think there's a deeper personal issue too, is that if you can ignore religion, you don't have to commit to it. If you, if you think religion's irrelevant, you don't have to have an opinion about it. If you think Islam and Christianity are the same, you don't have to choose. And so I think the strategy of misunderstanding religion, in a sense, arises from a deep religious, anti-religious impulse. Like, I don't want to have to think about this, so it must be irrelevant. Seven, Indonesia's Muslim population is around 88% of the nation. Um, in, Indonesia is known for its political moderation, uh, Muslim moderation. Is Indonesian Islam chiefly moderate because it follows alternative parts of the Quran, or is it moderate because it has syncretized other beliefs into Islam? I'd like to point out that 20 years ago, half a million Christians were internally displaced in Indonesia by a jihad, uh, which was brutal, and many were killed, and some were forcibly converted. So Indonesia is not without its jihad problems. And there's a religiously driven kind of genocidal uh, attack uh, long, slow uh, attack really being launched against the Papuans in West Papua in Indonesia too, which has disturbing religious drivers. But I think the fundamental issue why Indonesia is not an Islamic state and Indonesian Islam is more moderate is that it was only conquered, no, sorry, it was never conquered from outside. Indonesia was not Islamicized by external conquest, unlike India, for example, or most Islamic societies. And there was internal conquest. So it, it, kingdoms like Aceh or um, parts of Java spread out and conquered internally. and But but this happened from within the country. And second, uh, it's fairly recent. So Indonesia was Islamized or parts of it began to be Islamized around about the 16th century, which was the same time the Europeans were arriving. So Islam has really been established in Indonesia not much longer than than um, Catholicism or the, or colonialism. So it's it's recent, it's internally um, established. So often it, it's been syncretistic because of that. Um, it, it is, however, going through a um, a radicalization. Indonesia is gradually being transformed to a more orthodox image of Islam, and and that that will take generations. But Islamization is a is a multi generational. Uh, process. Question eight. Pope Francis pleads daily and even fast for peace negotiations and dialogues between I Israel and Hamas. Is there the slimmest hope that this might happen, sponsored perhaps by the Arab League? If if Hamas agrees to peace, oh no, this is my answer. <clears throat> if Hamas agrees to peace, it'll only be as an alternative to complete surrender. That is, Hamas is irrevocably committed to victory and to the destruction of Israel. And any any truce that it agreed to would only be because they felt it was the, in their own advantage to do so. So, And they would only do that faced with overwhelming force. Um, so if, if there was a peace, it would be a ruse, as, as happened with the Oslo Accords. So I think um, you will not achieve peace by trying to sort things out with Hamas. Hamas is determined to kill Israelis and to destroy Israel. It, has, it sees no other path for it, and the reasons for that are, are thoroughly religious. 
Nine, in the bandwidth of Christians' responses to violence in the name of Allah, what are amongst the best and the worst supplies? replies? Well, I think turn the other cheek doesn't work. I mean, the big challenge for Christians is that we need the state to be the state. That you know, Someone needs to wield the sword for the common good. It's not that the church should do that, but we need to support um, the, the use of force by the nation in order to defend itself, in order to defend people. Um, so I think when Christians lack a, um, a theology of, of the state and they, they act as if it was just all about per personal individual Christian response, then um, th they can react poorly to the threat that Islam presents. Um, sorry, that's a huge question, and I wish I could say more about it. Um, a really bad response also to violence is um, to befriend it. This is the Stockholm Syndrome. You know, you're taken captive by someone and you end up serving them. There's, there's three... Um, ways that an animal can respond to, to a fearful situation. One is fight, the other is flight, and the third one is tend and befriend. And that's probably the very worst response to Islamic violence, to reach out in in what you you claim to be love, but is actually fear, and befriend the one who's seeking to destroy you. And that's a bit of a temptation for Christians, and they can feel like they're being virtuous when they do it. Um. In uh, question 10, in responding to historic violence done in the name of Jesus, what are among the best and the worst responses Christians can make to their violent past? I think one of the problems for Christians as we think about the past is that our perceptions of history are not always accurate. Uh, for example, we have a very negative perception of the Crusades for all sorts of reasons. Um, but actually, the Crusades, I think, had a good intention, which was to liberate Christian lands from the yoke of Islam. And at that time, uh, Islam had been in um, the Middle East probably yeah, not as long as the Europeans had been in India, for example. Like colonialism in India had a longer history than, um, than, say, the occupation of Palestine, if I'm not mistaken, or similar, very similar time depth. So the idea of liberating these lands from uh, Islamic imperialism and colonialism was uh, not necessarily a bad idea. Um, also, you you know most of European Christi most of Christianity around the Mediterranean had been conquered and significantly damaged. So, um, you know the problem. My point is not so much to defend the Crusades, but if we go into thinking about our historic violence with false histories that have been nurtured for all sorts of cultural. Uh, reasons that makes the problem of responding to history quite difficult um, another example of a false idea is that it's very simplistic and misleading is to say that jews did better under islamic rule than they did under christian in christian societies that's a, a really misleading statement I and mean, jews were often massacred in islamic contexts um, and the actual comparison of Christian and Jewish anti-Semitism is a really complex task, but we often boil it down to a kind of very simple uh, and and false um, sort of almost stereotype of history. So one of the responses to history is is accuracy, under, paying attention to really understand it, understand it better. Um, I think adopting a kind of guilt, uh, a corporate guilt that is forever around your neck. Uh, it's not very helpful either. Um, I mean, I'm happy to uh, express deep grief and sorrow for the abuses of Christians in the past um, and and to be very clear about that and to express my horror at, for example, the complicity of German churches in the Nazi movement. And, um, you know, that is deeply distressing and it needs to be studied and understood how that happened. Um, but that doesn't mean that I should be personally take on personal guilt for things I didn't do and have no part of. So I, I'd say avoiding a kind of corporate guilty shame that, that debilitates us is important. Two more questions. 11, it seems clear that the current Gaza-Israel war will not stop until there's a surrender. It also seems clear that Iran will fail to resist in joining the war. Since you know believers from an Iranian background, how are they responding to the current war? What are they, what are they saying? Well, Basically, Iranians, most Iranians hate their government. That's been apparent in all the protests recently. And one of the reasons they hate the government 
is the government is been has been spending vast amounts of money on jihad around the Middle East instead of spending it on its own people. So they see the billions that Hamas says has been given to them by Iran as basically theft of of the Iranian people and and pulling Iran into a kind of warfare situation with America and other states um, is damaging Iran. So they dis, they dislike uh, what what Iran is doing. Um, there was an interesting video clip of a soccer match where um, the authorities had unfurled a large Palestinian flag in the middle of the soccer match in Iran. And the Iranians began to shout, the thousands of them around the soccer pitch began to shout, you can take your Palestinian flag and stick it up your, you know. So they're shouting, this is a video clip with, with a stadium full of men uh, shouting, uh, you know, you can take that flag and stick it. And... Um, it's very revealing. So uh, I don't know how how this will pan out in Iran, but is I- Iran's people, yes, there are ideologues amongst the Iranians that support Islam, but they're minority. But Iran, this is the, if Iran gets dragged into a war, Iran's its its people could well have yet another, you know, more intense reasons to reject the government. Um, question t- twelve. Can a convincing case be made from the Quran for either pacifism or political moderation? Or again, is unceasing violence in the name of Allah baked into the Quran? Um, I sometimes, it's a really interesting question, like could you justify peace from the Quran? Can you justify peace or war equally well from any holy book? <laughs> um, actually, the Quran is a really, it's a really big ask to try and justify a peaceful Islam. Uh, one um, intellectual, a uh, Muslim intellectual, argued that if you just take the peaceful verses of the Quran, which are the Meccan verses, and sort of suppress the later verses, you'll have a more peaceful Islam. So treat the earlier ones as primary. That's the opposite of the way Islam has always read the Quran. And in fact, that reformer was uh, put to death by the state for for making that suggestion. Um I can. I think it's it's a bit like playing cards. I don't know if you play bridge or whist or five hundred or one of those games. Um, if you've got a handful of aces and kings and queens and jacks, you know you, you're going to win tricks. If you've got twos and threes, uh, you're not going to win twi- tricks. You're going to lose. Um, and there are there verses in the Quran that you could use to justify pacifism. Yes, that's a seven or a six. But are there verses that? justify violence yes there's aces and kings and queens in abundance so it's a bit like playing cards the pacifist said look i found this verse in the quran that uh is peaceful you know you should i placed you on the earth so that you would know each other or something like that you know or to you your religion to me my religion to you your religion they'll find a verse like that um but they will they will be defeated by the ones who's holding who are holding the many, many more verses in the Quran that are just straightforward violent. Now, this has a really important practical outcome. If you're a young Muslim in a university and you've got two people trying to win your affections, win your allegiance to their Islamic movement, and one is saying, Islam is peaceful, look at my verses. And the other is saying, Islam is violent, look at my verses. And also look at the life of Muhammad as well and what he did. The person who's going to win that argument is the second person the person advocating violence. And that's why those movements that have been established around the world to reach out to young Muslim men are so successful. That's why when ISIS began its rampage, people came in their thousands from around the world to join them because they'd been reached by the message of the Quran and it is more compelling than the peaceful message. Um, I sometimes feel a bit sad when I find someone using the verses of the Quran to justify a peaceful interpretation. Sad because my natural inclination is to jump in and counter them and to say, actually, no, you're misrepresenting the Quran. But the risk of doing that is that I'll turn them into a jihadi, you know. (laughs) And I don't really want to do that. So, um, you know, it's tricky business, but you have to know that the Quran is, I would say the, the radical violent interpretation of the Quran is compelling based on the Quran itself. it's It makes sense. After 9-11, I read the Quran and I read the life of Muhammad and I was deeply disturbed because I came to the conclusion that the radical interpretations were sound. They were the, they were the, 
the most plausible explanations of Islam based on those texts. Those texts, in fact, had been curated and put together in order to convey that message. And um, that's a, it's a, it's a difficult thing for people to process, but that was, that was my conclusion. I'm going to finish up there and uh, I hope this video does get through to you. Here we go.